Welcome to the fourth and last part of the lecture on long-term memory and learning. Okay, now we speak about forgetting. And based on what we've just heard in the other, in the last section, we have the declarative memory with semantic and episodic, and this is retrospective memory in the past. And then we also have learned about the prospective memory from the future. But now we're talking about this part and forgetting in this part. Before looking at forgetting in long-term memory, I would like to cover something which we actually have not covered in the last lecture on short-term memory. And that is forgetting in short-term memory. The reason is I find it a little bit more natural to discuss forgetting um, in the same place. So, forgetting in short-term memory. Suppose you have a recall task and you get a single trigram, for instance, XAJ, usually in a way that you can't pronounce it as a word, but you have to remember, try to rehearse that, XAJ, XAJ. However, that rehearsal is prohibited because directly after the presentation, during the retention interval, you are asked to count backwards in it by threes. So, for instance, 60, 57, 54, 51, uh, 48, and so forth. And you should do that quickly, so that there's really no way that you could rehearse the words. Okay, and this counting backwards, the retention interval, varied in the study between 3 and 18 seconds. <clears throat> and after this retention interval, there's a free recall of just these three letters. So what can people remember in their short-term memory if they ca cannot rehearse? And this is what has been found by Peterson and Peterson in the late 1950s. And what you see is that forgetting follows a so-called power function. So here on the x-axis we see the recall interval in seconds. So this is 18 seconds. So 18 seconds ago, the participants have seen the trigram and they had no chance to rehearse that. And you see, they remember probably less than 10% even. And the power function means that initially there's a very a rather high rate of forgetting and this rate of forgetting slows down towards the end and is getting slower and slower. And this, a lot of forgetting processes follow such a power function. The parameters, the exact parameters of such a function may differ, but um, it often follows such a function. Okay, so there are two theories, at least, which have been proposed to explain forgetting in short-term memory. One is that it's due to decay so, in other words, information fades away if it's not reactivated and kept alive. An alternative is the so-called interference theory. And here it is that information does not fade away, but instead that it interferes with old or new information. And this interference makes it hard or impossible for us to retrieve the information. It gets, gets all intermingled. Let's have a look at this interference theory because there's quite a bit of evidence for that. And usually there are two different types of interference um, which are distinguished. One is proactive interference. And to better understand um, these different types. Uh, think of the typical experiment people used in that context and that was learning word lists. So you would first learn one list of let's say 10 words and then you learn another list of 10 words and then later on you are asked to recall the lists or the words from the first list, list or the words from the second list. And proactive interference means that I find it difficult to learn the second list because I learned the first list before. So the first list 
causes interference in learning the second list. This is called proactive interference. The second type of interference, which we typically can see in such studies, is um, that if I learn new material, I find it difficult to recall what I have learned first. And this is called retroactive interference. So the new material makes it hard to recall the old material. And these both mechanisms can work at the same time. They are independent from each other. The interference in long-term memory, inter as we have seen, arises mainly by semantic similarity. So, in this example where we learn two lists, <coughs> if we first learn a list of numbers, <coughs> apologies, and then a list of letters, we are usually quite good in recalling both of them without much interference between them. However, if we first learn a list of words and then a list of synonyms of the first of the of those words, then we will find it very, very difficult and challenging. Now, this was already a transition to long term because in these word lists with proactive and retroactive in, um, uh, interference, these are already mechanisms working in, in the long term memory. And um, the question now is, this: these word lists are somewhere at the boundary and they can be within short-term memory or long-term memory or in the very fresh long-term memory. Now when we for speak about forgetting in long-term memory what follows now, I'm speaking about things on a different time scale of more like hours and days and not just two minutes ago a word list or something. So the question is whether for these type of memories we have the same mechanisms like decay and interference or different ones and the answer is we have different ones. And before we look into these mechanisms we should ask ourselves why do we forget in the first place. We are now talking about long-term memory and here the point is that forgetting is totally normal and we forget most of our experiences and information about our environment at least after some time so if you think about the amount of stuff you had memorized during your life for instance in school at some points you were able to just um, memorize so many facts you have learned. You probably have forgotten a lot of them. We already spoke about the episodic, episodic memory that we forget so many things of our everyday life. What do we have for lunch a month ago? And things like that. And it's actually useful to forget this information because it reduces the demands on our memory system. If you really would remember everything, every little detail, it would first of all may reach the capacity of our system and second of all it may become very difficult to filter out what information is useful and important to remember and so our memory system tries to make this decision for us and what it thinks is not required for us in the future can be dismissed and frees up resources. There are two explanations for forgetting in long-term memory and one is to that we lose our ability to access the information so technically it's still there but we just can't access it and the other one is that we have an active deletion of information let's have a look at the inability to access and when we want to access contents in our long-term memory then we need so-called retrieval cues and they act like an index in a memory system, you know, they're like pointers towards something. Let's have an example of that. And I will give you some of these retrieval cues and um, see what memory is accessed when you get these cues. Mouse, smart, cute, Disney, and most people already are 
at Mickey Mouse to get that and may have had the hypothesis already earlier on. However, suppose some retrieval cues are deleted or they don't link anymore to this memory. So the picture of Mickey Mouse is still in our memory but it's not linked to Mouse or Smart anymore. When we only have Cute or Disney, well that's a lot which we can, all the princesses and everything um, which, which we can recall from these cues, so we don't know yet. We can't access the memor memory of Mickey. And this is quite challenging for researchers to make the distinction between is the memory lost truly lost or is the memory still there and just can't be accessed but for a proper understanding of the memory system it's important to understand the difference however we may still be able to access the memory of Mickey if we use different cues so for another person if we lose, lost mouse and smart maybe if we hear Minnie Mouse and Pluto and Goofy a friend of all of them then we may suddenly say, oh, do you mean Mickey Mouse? And this is actually something you can very often observe in, in our everyday life. When we say, um, oh, do you remember this uh, one actor who played, um, what's his name, in The Born Identity? And you may say, um, no, I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, he's, he's the one who also played in this other movie. Um, he's married to this person, don't you know that? Uh, he's, a, he's a very good friend with Ben Affleck. What you effectively do is you work your way through retrieval cues to access the memory because you know it's there but you can't get there. The alternative or the second explanation is that memory traces are actually deleted. So if we don't need it anymore, if our system thinks we don't need it anymore, it can be discarded. And this happens not in an immediate and final way, even not in directed or intentional forgetting. That's actually a research paradigm uh, which works. So if you give participants information which they should learn, uh, let's say two word lists, and then you tell them, okay, please forget this one word list and you give them some time and then later on test them on recall they are actually worse in the word list which they tried to forget so we even have some very limited conscious uh, control over the deletion of long-term memory contents instead it's a slow process and Barik and colleagues investigated try to get an idea of the time course of this. So what they did is they uh, asked 276 alumni, so people who finished their university studies, and about their grades. And some of them graduated up to 54 years ago. And then they saw how much can you remember of your grades. And this is the curve. and. Um, it's a little bit cluttered graph, I will walk you through that. So here you have the retention interval in years. So you see up to 50 years here. And here is basically a measure of how much they were able to recall. And we just look at this solid line, which stands, which shows the correct recall. And like in the short-term memory forgetting, we see a power function. So in the beginning, people forget quite a bit and then the forgetting slows down. You should remember this is a cross-sectional study so it's not the same person who has been asked directly after graduation and 50 years later but you have a group of people who has graduated around 45 to 50 years ago and another group who has graduated around 30 to 35 years ago. Interestingly this why this is still a power function it's a very different time frame short-term memory there we had a time frame of 18 seconds here we have nearly 50 years okay do you have any questions on forgetting 
If so, post them on BBL. And before concluding with the lecture, um, we can skip this non-declarative part. I said something about this in the beginning. I'm basically now saying again that I don't say much more about this. Let's turn to our demonstration from the beginning. You know, we had this 15 animal names and the 15 um, city names. And please try to write down as many animal names you can remember. And you can just pause the video and take a minute or so to do that. Okay, here are the animals and you can see how many you have got right. And again, maybe pause the video for that. Now we do the same thing for city names. Write down everything, all the city names you can remember. Pause the video. Okay. Here are the names and please uh, note down how many you had right. Again, you can call, pause the video for me to make this comparison. Okay, so again, we don't do it in Paul Everywhere. But what we see is that in the beginning, when we do this recall directly after you have seen the word list, there is a slight advantage for the cities because there is a deeper encoding. However, after a while, and you may not have, not have watched these videos all in one go, so maybe there's even a couple of days in between when you learned the word lists now, um, this, on, on average, this difference becomes even, even bigger. So if I do the poll everywhere at the end of the class, so roughly an hour, one and a half hours after they, the students have learned the lists, then you can see a more pronounced difference between the animals, which have been memorized by road rehearsal and have show a poorer performance, and the cities, which have been learned by um, an elaborative rehearsal, working with the information, which shows a better recall, usually. Okay, thanks for watching. Next week we will start uh, and speak about language. See you then. Bye-bye.